Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game, Unmatched, designed by J.R. Honeycutt, Rob Davio, and Justin Jacobson, and published by Restoration and Mondo Games, who helped sponsor this video. The legends are assembling, but they're not here to tell a fairy tale. King Arthur, Sinbad, Medusa, Alice in Wonderland, they're spoiling for a fight, and they're gonna find one, and so will you. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the double-sided board in the center of the play area, with either of the sides face up, and the different sides just provide different layouts and new ways to experience a fight. Each player now chooses one of the four included heroes, along with its 30-card action deck, which will be marked with that hero's name here on the back. We'll assume that you have two players, but there are rules for three or four player team games that we'll talk about later. Each person also takes one of these hero cards that matches the hero they chose, and it will also list any sidekicks that they come with here at the bottom. You then collect the matching named health dials, and each hero will have its own, which you'll set to the value shown here, and if their sidekick has a dial, you'll set it to this value. Some heroes, like Medusa here, will have more than one sidekick, and if so, those sidekicks won't come with the dial. Instead, the value shown here is how many of those sidekick tokens you should collect. Now take your hero miniature and their sidekick token, if any, along with all other components that may go with them. In the box, these are each organized within their own sections, and so you can just pull out everything related to a character which has their name beside it here. For this video, we've set up a game between Medusa and King Arthur, and each player now shuffles their action cards to form a single face-down deck, drawing a starting hand of five cards. You can look at your own cards at any time, but keep them a secret from your opponent. The younger player now sets their hero on the space of the board marked with a one, placing their sidekicks, if any, in separate empty spaces within the same zone as their hero. Let's stop here and just talk about the layout of the board, which is also known as the battlefield. The circles that are printed on it are the spaces that the fighters will go into, and you'll be able to move from one space to another during the game if they're connected by a line. Two spaces connected by a line are also considered to be adjacent to each other. Well, spaces that share the same color are all said to be part of the same zone. If a space shows colors from several zones, then it's a part of all those pictured zones. So we said during the setup that Merlin had to be placed into the same zone as Arthur. Arthur shows these two colors, so Merlin could go into either of these two spaces or any of these three spaces. You don't have to match all of the colors just one of them. This is also a good time to mention that although all of the characters on the board are considered fighters, a miniature is known as the hero and tokens are known as sidekicks. Once your pieces have been placed on the board, this is also when you would make any decisions that are required for your fighter at the start of the game. In the case of King Arthur, there's nothing more that we have to do. But if, for example, you were using Alice's character, then this is when you would decide what size she would start the game as, and this is simply a special feature that her character has. Now the older player puts their hero on the space marked with a two, and sets their sidekicks into the related zone or zones. And although the rules say that you should pick these positions based on who the younger or older player is, if you're playing several matches against the same opponent, you can certainly feel free to mix this up. And that's the setup. In Unmatched Battle of Legends, you and the other player will be taking on the role of classic legendary characters fighting for dominance on a battlefield. And you'll do this with your character's abilities that are driven by their individual powers and this deck that you have. Also, each hero will have a certain amount of health. And if you can reduce an opponent's hero down to zero health, then you immediately win. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the youngest player and then going back and forth. And on your turn, you'll perform two actions. If you flip over your character card, you will find a summary of a turn and the reminder here that you must take two actions on your turn. You can't take just one. And the three different actions all players can choose from are summarized here. And when you take your actions, you can pick from any combination of two of them or you can also choose to do the same action for both. But next, let's see how each of these work, starting with Maneuver, which is made up of two steps. The first of which is drawing a card from your deck. Anytime the game tells you to draw cards, unless otherwise stated, you must do it. 
And as you'll see, over the course of the game, you'll continue getting to draw cards, and some of them will end up in a discard pile. Now, if your deck is ever completely empty, your fighters are said to be exhausted. From this point on, anytime you need to draw a card when your deck is empty, you do not reshuffle your discard pile into a new deck. Instead, each of your fighters take two damage for each card you cannot draw, but were meant to. Now, anytime you take damage, you reduce that fighter's health dial by the amount of damage that it received. Sidekicks that don't have a health dial, like Medusa's Harpies, have a health of one and are defeated if they take any amount of damage. Sidekicks, when defeated, are just removed from the board. But if your hero is defeated, the game just ends and your opponent wins. Going back to the maneuver action, after you draw one card, you may choose to move any number of your fighters and each can go up to a total number of spaces equal to or less than your move value, which is printed here on your character card. Now, when taking this action, you also have the option of boosting your movement by discarding a single card from your hand into a personal discard pile and adding its boost value, which is printed here, to your normal movement value. So by choosing this one, I would now be able to move each of my fighters up to four spaces each. When you move, you must always go from one space to an adjacent one. You are allowed to move through friendly fighters, but not enemies, and you must end your move on an empty space. The order in which you move your fighters is up to you, but you must finish moving one fighter before you start moving another. And you don't have to move all of them the same number of spaces. You might move one of them several spaces and another, you might only move one space or not at all. That said, if an effect ever lets you move an opponent's fighter, then you must respect all of the same movement rules, but from the perspective of your opponent. Another option on your turn is to perform the scheme action, and to do this, you play a scheme card from your hand, which will have this icon in the top left-hand corner, and you'll put this face up in front of you. You then declare which of your fighters is playing the scheme, and that makes them the active fighter. And the one that you choose must be listed here under the icon. So to play this one, you'd have to activate King Arthur. This one would require Merlin. Well, this one, which comes from the Medusa deck, can be activated by Medusa or any of her sidekicks. This matters because you may not play a scheme card if the listed fighter is defeated. So if Merlin had been removed from the game, then I would no longer be able to play this scheme. Assuming you can play the scheme, the chosen fighter is considered the active one, and then you resolve the effect shown here and discard this card face up. Each player will have their own discard pile where any cards that they play are then placed, and any player is allowed to check any discard pile at any time. There are a certain number of copies of each card in a player's deck. And in the bottom corner here, it tells you how many of those copies exist. For example, there's only one copy of this particular The Lady in the Lake card whereas there are three copies of this faint card. Sometimes it can be helpful to know how many copies of a particular card an opponent might have. The final type of action is an attack, and you'll start by announcing the fighter that is attacking, and then you'll perform three steps. First, declare your target. Any fighter can target an opponent in an adjacent space, which for King Arthur means he can only target this harpy. Although it looks like Medusa is very close to him, their spaces are not connected by a line, so they are not considered adjacent. Fighters with this melee symbol by their name can only attack adjacent enemies. But if they have the range symbol, like Merlin does, then they can target fighters in an adjacent space or a fighter anywhere in their zone. And remember, if you're on a space that shows more than one zone, then that means with a ranged attack, you could target any other space that shares any one of those colors. In this case, Merlin could target either this Harpy or even Medusa over here because both of them are on a brown space like Merlin is. If you don't have a valid target, you can't attack, but assuming you do, the attacker chooses and places face down one attack card from their hand. Attack cards will show red in the corner with this burst symbol, and also the name shown underneath of that symbol must again match the character that's using the card. So in this case, King Arthur is the one attacking, so this card is valid. Then the defender may pick a single defense card, which will be blue and have a shield here. But in this case, the name here says Medusa. But King Arthur is not attacking Medusa, instead he's attacking this harpy, so this would not be a valid card to play. The defender can even choose not to play a defense if they can't or don't want to. 
In your deck, you may also find cards with purple in the corner and this icon, which means it's versatile. These cards can be played as either attack or defense cards, and they count as both for the purposes of other game effects. You'll also notice this one here says any, so that means the harpy could be using this as a defense, so we'll place it face down here. Once both players are ready, these cards are revealed and you move to the final step of the attack, resolving combat. Most cards have effects at the bottom with a note at the start for when those effects occur, and there's three possible times they'll trigger. Either immediately, during combat, or after combat, like we see in these three examples. Now, when both cards have been revealed during an attack, you first resolve the immediately effects, and when those are done, you resolve any during combat effects. And if two effects would ever appear to resolve at the same time, let's say both players had played during combat cards, then the defenders will always resolve first. Once any immediately or during combat effects have been resolved, check the value on the attack card as shown here and subtract the defense value, if any, on the defender's card. The leftover amount is the damage the defending fighter takes, and they subtract that amount from their health dial. So in this case, 4 minus 3 is 1, so they would lose 1 life. Now in the example we have here, King Arthur is attacking this harpy token, which does not have a life dial. As we saw in that case, any amount of damage will defeat it. With the damage assigned, if any, you then resolve any after combat effects on the played cards, even if they're on the card of a fighter who is just defeated. Unless that defeated fighter was a hero, in which case the game would immediately end. In this case, because we have a tie for the timing, the defender's card would go first. Now this one says that you would move your fighter up to three spaces. In this case, because the fighter was defeated, there is no token here to move, so this effect would be ignored. Then this one says that after combat, this player would draw two cards, which they'll then take from their deck. Some after combat effects resolve based on who won the combat. The attacker is counted as winning if they dealt at least one damage to the defender, not counting any other damage that might have come from other effects. The defender wins the combat if they took no damage from the attack, even if they took other damage from certain card effects. Either way, assuming the game isn't over, then any played cards are now put into their respective discard piles. And those are the three possible actions. Maneuver, Scheme, and Attack. But each player also has a special ability, which is printed here on their character card, so make sure you take advantage of that during the game as well, when you can. Once a player has performed their two actions, their turn ends. And while you can have any number of cards in your hand during your turn, at the end, if you have more than seven, then you must discard down to seven. Then it's your opponent's turn, and the game will continue like this, back and forth, until a player defeats their opponent's hero to win them the game. If you have three or four players, there are also team play rules included, and you'll find those at the back of the rule book, which you can pause here and read if you'd like, but otherwise, I'll leave those for you to discover on your own. At the time of this release, there's also a standalone expansion for just two players called Robin Hood vs. Bigfoot that pits these two fighters against each other, allowing you to play head-to-head. -head. However, you can also mix and match fighters from any of the unmatched sets, and more said to be on the way. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Unmatched. If you have any questions about anything that you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get a notification anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks for watching.